soil and uh, to make this the foundation for the future palaces and houses uh, stronger, they drained um, soil and made a lot of canals. So this is one more reason why there are so many canals in St. Petersburg. Then Peter I didn't want to have any bridges in St. Petersburg. He didn't like even an idea of a single bridge, but he was very fond of Venice and its canals, and that's why the Tsar um, uh, even gave a lot of money to his friend, uh, whose name was Alexander, who was simultaneously the governor of St. Petersburg for digging the canals. We all have just been on that Basil Island where your boat is docked. And probably you'll notice that there are a lot of very narrow streets there. So they all were supposed to be uh, canals. So there are about 40 streets, which goes one parallel to another one. They are all very narrow, and all buildings were constructed along the streets because they all were supposed to be the canals. But a uh, friend of uh, Peter, the, instead of digging canals, he spent this money on the construction of his luxurious palace. And that's why, unfortunately, the dream of Peter the first never came true, and the canals uh, Dozens of canals were never dig on the Basil Island, but anyway, the Tsar banned the construction of all bridges in St. Petersburg, and every resident of St. Petersburg received a small boat. The boat, uh, uh, every resident of St. Petersburg, and uh, it was Peter the first who wrote down the rules how to operate this boat himself. So if there were several hundred. A uh, dozen of people living in St. Petersburg, every person had a boat, and there were no bridges. As for Neva River, as for the Neva River, the first bridge across the Neva River, N-E-V-A, that's how we should spell the name of this river, the first one was uh, created only um, uh, 150 years after the city was, was founded, in the middle of the 19th century. Before that, this was just the pontoon bridges here in St. Petersburg, just the pontoon bridges. Sometimes, sometimes, there was no limitation here. The next time, we had a boat, we have boat, or what? It's so cold, always. It's so cold in Russia, so uh, half of the year the rivers were covered with ice and uh, people used to cross them just on ice and uh, they had the skating and skiing on the ice. So that's a little story about the, river, uh, the, the bridges and the, the reason for such a big number of canals just in one St. Petersburg. So far, uh, let me uh, give comments about the buildings which were passing by, and it seems to me that most of you right now are attracted by the beauty of the fortress which is coming on your left-hand side. It is Peter and Paul Fortress. Peter and Paul Fortress, uh, which was named so in honor of two apostles, Peter and Paul. So look how big, how mighty it looks like. Uh, the walls of the fortress are rather low. These are just uh, several, uh, mid they are just several meters high, and that's it. In comparison to the fortresses which were constructed, let's say, in 15th century, in 16th century, uh, and the walls were very high in order for enemies not to reach it, these walls are so low, and still, this fortress never saw an action. Nobody ever tried to capture it. That's because uh, the uh, fortress has such a plan uh, of a prolongated hexagon with six bastions and two ravelins that the perimeter of the fortress is very, very big. The fortress is about two kilometers in perimeter, uh, which helped to place hundreds of cannons on top of it, hundreds of cannons. And that's why in the 18th century it was much more important to have a big number of cannons on the walls to protect the fortress. Uh, right now, uh, the grounds of the fortress are used as the museum, but in all days it was a uh, military fortification uh, with a lot of buildings which were constructed for the soldiers, which were made uh, um, as houses for the artillery, and also there was the prison simultaneously here. 
Now there are about 20 museums on the grounds of this fortress. 20 museums. But uh, this fortress is tremendously popular, not only because uh, of these museums, but mostly because of the sand beach, which we all can see so well. Uh, yesterday, when we visited the fortress, it was the usual day of the week, so you couldn't see a lot of people there. But believe me, that when this is the day off, there are hundreds of people uh, on the island of that fortress, sentaining, enjoying themselves on this beach, because it's the only place where Russians can find one in the city center. Uh, well, so lucky with the weather, at least in the morning, but um, it tends to be cloudy again, but don't be disappointed, because usually, uh, according to statistics, there are only 60 days of sunny weather a year. 60 days a year here in St. Petersburg. Uh, of the weather, which is perfectly sunny, no wonder that there is the joke about the weather uh, popular in St. Petersburg, that there are nine years, uh, nine months of expectations and uh, three months of disappointment uh, here in St. Petersburg. And that's very typical for the city. That's why every little chance uh, local people used to get some vitamin D. That's for sure. Right on the grounds of this fortress, which they also use uh, for uh, different uh, championships like volleyball, um, some sand uh, sculpture, competition, contest, uh, and, and other, other things. So the fortress is still tremendously popular. Then on the grounds of the fortress, it's very easy to see uh, the uh, cathedral, which we visited yesterday, which, which is the tallest structure in the city center. The, the height of the spire of the cathedral is 122.5 meters high. 122 and a half, which must be uh, equal to 360 feet, I would say. And uh, uh, this is the place where the imperial family was buried. And the, on top of the spire of the foot of the cathedral, there is the angel, which holds the cross. Because every Orthodox uh, uh, church must have a cross. And um, I would like to share with you one of the Russian traditions. Maybe some of you are familiar. And does anybody uh, can tell me uh, what I mean if I do it like that, if I flick under my chin? Okay, I can stand if you don't see me really well. If I flick under my chin, like that, does anybody know? No? That's your second day in Russia. <laughs> okay, that's why you came here. <laughs> it means let's have a drink. Let's have a drink. And it's a tradition which is quite widespread all over the uh, country. Everybody knows it. Every Russian knows it. Yeah. So we should flick. Yes, under the chin. And let me share you uh, why this tradition uh, is so popular and why it, uh, everybody knows about it. So the tradition goes to the angel, which we can find on top of the spire. Be uh, because in, uh, in 1730, so in the uh, beginning of the 18th century, there, were, there was a very strong wind in St. Petersburg. Very strong wind. After which the angel was declined. And of course, they had to fix it upright. And uh, uh, these were the engineers of the Empress who calculated how much money they all need uh, to make the scaffolding around uh, such a high uh, spire and uh, fix the nature. And then the Empress, when she was showing the numbers, she was shocked with a uh, very high price for the scaffoldings and she refused to waste so much money. And uh, she ordered to find a very strong man who would be eager enough to climb on top of the spire without any scaffoldings and uh, uh, fix the angel himself. And what do you think? They found such a fool. Actually, actually he was alcoholic and uh, he had nothing to lose. And uh, he had no family, no property, really nothing. And uh, he agreed to do this job because he was, pay he was promised to be with whatever he wanted and uh, he agreed to do, the, to do this very dangerous job and he took a heavy ball and tied it to a rope and then threw it into the air and uh, uh, he fixed the ball on top and climbed on top of the spire just using the rope and his fingers and that's 120 meters high 360 feet about uh, and so he did the job, then he came to the Empress and uh, he said, well, you promised to pay me. And 
and she offered money, palaces, she offered some uh, noble um, uh, sign, and, but he refused to take anything because he asked to give uh, him a piece of paper a piece of paper, which uh, uh, would be the uh, Tsar law, uh, verifying that he could get a drink free of charge uh, in the bar, a, a drink free of charge, so like the Empress paper. And what she had to do, she, she had to give it to him because she promised to pay him. But of course, he's, uh, very soon he lost it. Uh, and that's why uh, when he came back and said, well, I'm sorry, I lost the paper. Could you give me another one? She decided to make a tattoo on his uh, neck under the chin so that he came and uh, uh, showed his tattoo under the chin and everybody must give him this uh, free shot. Yeah, and it's not just a fake story which I want uh, you to hear. <laughs> that's because there were a lot of dangerous jobs in this country and uh, this became a very envelope for alcoholics, of course, and it became a very popular uh, drink, very uh, popular drink and uh, kind of payment, I would say. So when you come to a Russian restaurant, if you want to get some beer in the in the restaurant today or vodka, just show it to the waiter, and he will never ask you coffee or tea. What do you mean? He will offer you all of this whiskey, brandies, and, uh, and so on, and so on. Yeah. Well, what about the other sites which were passing by? Now on your right hand side, let me draw your attention uh, at this glowing uh, little dome which we can see uh, on your left hand side. This is the chapel which was constructed in 2003 right on top of the place where the Orthodox Church of Holy Trinity was destroyed. This uh, chapel on your left hand side. Uh, there were thousands of churches destroyed by the uh, Soviet government. Thousands of churches all over the country. Maybe you remember this uh, St. Isaac's Cathedral or the Church of the Spirit of God. Fortunately, they were not destroyed, though the, some of them were filled in with gall powder and the decision to explode it was cancelled at the last moment. But uh, thousands of churches were destroyed, though officially religion wasn't forbidden. Officially it wasn't forbidden, but if the person wanted to have a nice job, uh, to have a career and they didn't want to have problems with KGB, he was not supposed to go to churches. But people were really afraid of KGB, believe me, that uh, this organization scared everybody, especially in 1930s. Let me share one of the anecdotes uh, with you to give you how bad the KGB was in comparison to right now. Uh, uh, and uh, this is the joke which happened in the Kamunalka flat. Kamunalka flat, that's the flat uh, which uh, uh, had several families living in it. So at the Soviet time, Soviet government usually gave one family just one room in the flat. And if the flat here in the city center had, let's say, five, seven rooms, there were five or seven families living there who had to share a kitchen, share a bathroom. And uh, so that uh, story about KGB happened in this Kamunalka flat. Uh, so just imagine, 1930s. And this was um, night time. And, uh, and everybody heard the knock of the door. Knock, knock, knock. And the all were so scared. They, sh they were sure that this was the KGB officer who uh, came to arrest one of them. And they all were so scared. And then they heard it again. Knock, knock, knock. And they all pretended that they were asleep. But then the oldest uh, person who was living in that flat, uh, he said, well, I'm the oldest. I had such a long life. What should be I afraid of? That would be the bravest to go outside and check what's happening. And then he went outside and uh, he uh, came back and said, Comrades, comrades, don't worry, it's only fire. <laughs> you see, they were not so much afraid of fire as the KGB. But uh, uh, that's why a lot of people didn't visit the churches. And uh, a lot of them were destroyed. Unfortunately, the ones which were not destroyed were turned into, let's say, uh, temples of, uh, of, like, museums of atheism, kindergartens, uh, uh, prison, uh, uh, mental hospitals, and, and so on. So, so on. Then, uh, also, on your uh, left-hand side, uh, very soon we're going to pass by the long yellow building, uh, which is the apartment house. The long yellow building on your left hand side. The apartment which was constructed uh, in the early 20th century by the order of the Soviet government, uh, who uh, decided to give uh, flats in this apartment, 
Chechen, which is putting the political prisoners, political prisoners. So the ones who were imprisoned by the order of uh, uh, Nicholas II and his uh, father, so political prisoners. And now it is one of the most prestigious places to live, because look, just imagine what you view they have uh, through the windows. And uh, it's the city center. They can, the quality of the building is the best, because at solid time, they all everything was the best. I was so afraid of him that uh, they did their job very well. And on top of this long yellow building on your left-hand side, uh, there are two statues. The statue of the walker and the statue of a soldier. So these are representative of two main classes of the Soviet Union. Then let me draw your attention on your right hand side. And now we are passing by <coughs> this long chain of the buildings. Uh, I, I, I hope that with all of my stories you don't forget to enjoy <laughs> the panorama uh, during our chance to see a city from the water. So, I would like to draw your attention at these palaces. So they belong to the richest families of Russia, to the millionaires who, who, who had enough money to have their palace right in the city center. And uh, talking about the blue one, which is on your right hand side, this is the palace which belonged to a famous uh, Russian uh, general, Kutuzov. Kutuzov. This uh, name must be familiar because we saw the portrait of Kutuzov yesterday in the Hermitage. This was the main general of the Russian army during the Napoleonic War, which was of course uh, very important uh, for Russians. And uh, Kutuzov uh, was the best general and unfortunately he was uh, wounded during the war and uh, he died uh, quite, quite soon after the war. Uh, but uh, the embankment which is on your right hand side is named after him, Kutuzov Embankment. As for the rest of the structures which are coming on your right hand side, so look at its elegant atmosphere. So that's why I like St. Petersburg so much. I think that that's the most romantic, the most elegant and peaceful city you can find in the whole country. Well, uh, that's the only city which you see in this country. <laughs> so you just should trust me, <laughs> that's, that's the best. And uh, uh, that's because after the construction of the Winter Palace, it was forbidden to make uh, any anything else uh, higher than the Winter Palace. That's why all uh, structures of St. Petersburg, which were constructed before the Soviet time, they all are so flat, they are not higher than 22 meters high, uh, and they have two, three, or sometimes four storms. So that's why the city looks so peaceful and so harmonious, because uh, so all the buildings are very low. Uh, then all of them have pale colors, pale colors, and uh, like yellowish, uh, pinkish, bluish, greenish. Peter the first uh, wanted uh, Saint Petersburg to look like Venice, and he didn't want gloomy buildings to be constructed in the city. And that's why, if somebody wanted to have the facade colored in dark color, like dark gray, dark brown, they had to pay a lot of taxes. A lot of taxes. Sometimes the tax was uh, the tax was equal to about uh, the the cost of the whole palace. Yeah. So that's why most of the, the majority of palaces in Saint Petersburg are very uh, pale. And then um, on your uh, right hand side there is the view to the Neva Riva. Um, well, the river is rather short. That's the direction to the middle of the country, to Lake Ladoga. And uh, that's the, also the area where St. Petersburg will be over soon. Then on your uh, right hand side also there is this uh, low uh, yellow building. Do you see it so far? Yeah? <laughs> on your, coming on the right but straight ahead over there. Uh, the low uh, yellow building, uh, which uh, was one of the first uh, stone, construction, uh, stone buildings constructed in St. Petersburg. This is the building of the uh, military hospital, military hospital which was constructed at the time of Peter the First. By the by, the way, the Tsar uh, learned medicine himself as well, but unfortunately, all his patients died. So and, uh, he was a good Tsar, but not a very good doctor. Unfortunately, he gave up and uh, and uh, gave a chance to professionals to take care of the uh, soldiers. So that was the military hospital one of the first stone buildings of St. Petersburg, and it's still hospital. It's still hospital. And I once, I remember, I was uh, walking next to the facade of this yellow building, and uh, a hospital for soldiers, and uh, it's, of course, uh, forbidden to smoke inside. 
Once I remember, there was the box tied to a rope hanging from the second floor with the words, oh, please put a cigarette into it. <laughs> I like that. But cigarettes are not expensive, unfortunately. It's, uh, one pack costs just a couple of dollars. So smoking is a big problem, but the government tries to fight with it, and uh, probably little by little the situation will change soon. Then, on your left-hand side in the distance, uh, we are coming closer and closer and closer to a big gray boat, uh, which is called Cruiser Aurora. Cruiser Aurora, yeah. So this three chimney gray boat, we are coming closer, so you definitely all will be able to see it. This is the boat which was launched in uh, uh, 1903 for the Russian-Japanese war. Unfortunately, the Russians, uh, for Russians, of course, lost that war. Uh, and uh, uh, next time, this boat was used in uh, the First World War. Uh, she was too old for the Second World War, uh, which happened in the middle of the 20th century. But its cannons were taken off the boat and were placed along the front line for the, for the protection of uh, the city. Uh, but uh, right now, uh, this boat is the